Welcome to Ladies Talking Leafs. I'm Chris. And I'm Syl. And this Leaf team is really taking us through an emo- emotional roller coaster. Not unusual, obviously, for the Leafs. We should be used to it by now. Um, but uh, they're in a really tough stretch of games right now, playing eight games in 13 nights. And so far, it hasn't gone very well. So uh, a lot to get into with it, with that. But first, with the NFL playoffs in full swing and the NHL and NBA seasons at the halfway point, Bet Online has you covered with all the odds, news, and scores. With additional odds, lines, trends, and info on both desktop and mobile, you can access the world's best wagering information anytime. So head there today to get into the action and see all the updated odds. Remember to use promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Currently, Bet Online has the Leafs at plus 650 to win the Eastern Conference. One surprise is that the Lightning are at plus 1400 uh, as well. Um, they're currently a point ahead of the Leafs in the standings, but the Leafs have two games in hand. So we'll see how that all shakes out in the end. Bet Online, where the game starts. So please gamble responsibly if you or someone you know needs support or advice. Reach out to Connex Ontario or an organization near you. So place your limits and stay within it. All right. So a quick reminder, there's less than a week away to uh, to vote for Ladies Talking Leafs as the best hockey podcast for the Sports Podcast Awards. If you have already voted, thank you so much. We re- so much appreciate it. Yeah. If you haven't voted yet, uh, you still have time to do so, and you can find the link to vote in our show notes and across all our social media channels, uh, X, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Threads. Our handle there is at LTL1917, and you can also vote on our website. So with the All-Star Game coming up um, in a couple of weeks, we just want to mention that we will be going to many of the events. It's in Toronto, so that's uh, that's great for us. Um, and there's the skills competition will be attending the NHL Fanfare, and we'll be posting all of our All-Star experiences uh, across all of our social media channels as well. So hit that follow and subscribe button and don't miss any of our updates. On the topic of the All-Star Game, Leafs Nation... Did not disappoint, and I was part of that, and Syl was too. I'm <laughs> getting three more of our Leafs through to the to the game through the All Star voting. Uh, William Nylander, Mitch Marner, and Morgan Riley are going to join Austin Matthews uh, to represent the Leafs. And yeah, the league put out the jerseys and the players that the players will be wearing, and the uh, and named the captains and celebrity captains. So I don't know the jerseys. I was okay with it, but um, they're a bit loud for me, but uh, mm-hmm. it, whatever. It's Well, I don't think I it guess. was a shock that they were going to do a collaboration between Drew House and that yeah. Justin Bieber would be one of the celebrity coaches. Um, I think that, you know, the All-Star Game is more for the kids. They are trying to basically, you know, apart from giving sponsorship, uh, their sponsors uh, a platform, um, you know, they, they're trying to foster that relationship with, uh, with young people, you know, so, so that they're, they're kind of cartoony and, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're all right. And what did you think of the, uh, the cat? Well, obviously the captains, we knew how they were going to mm-hmm. be and like the piece, I guess the celebrity captains. Mm-hmm. Like, did you, I mean, we pretty much knew Justin Bieber was going to be with Austin yeah. Matthews, yeah. right? I, I, mean, I felt bad for Will Arnett. Mm-hmm. Because he yeah. basically, you know, got the short end. I'm sure he wanted to be uh, the celebrity captain for the Leafs so bad. Uh, yeah. But, you know, the fact that he's going to be with Connor McDavid, I guess that's, you know, consolation prize. Um, I'm sure he's just happy to be part of the whole festivities. And yeah. like he said on uh, on his ex um, that, you know, he's happy to showcase his hometown of Toronto. So, um yeah, I think it's yeah. going to be, I think it's going to be good. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, I was <laughs> well, off the air. We were, I was just telling Syl before that I had no idea who this Tate McRae was, the one mm-hmm. that I guess is the celebrity the young, captain. The young kids will know <laughs> who she is for sure. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then Michael Buble, I know Michael mm-hmm. Buble, obviously, right? With the, uh, but I thought that was kind of cool that they had uh, like Jack and Quinn Hughes together, I guess, for that. Mm-hmm. The, um, hopefully Jack, but Jack Hughes is injured, so. I don't know. Like, hopefully he's... Well, he might still uh, 
go as captain. Like I was thinking, I was wondering that we're discussing with my family too, that, uh, you know, you still see Bedard, for example, um, in all the advertising material and everything. I I don't think he's likely to play, but they still may be there. Uh, even yeah. if they're not playing just as uh, just to showcase the players and, and to participate yeah. because they can participate in, for example, the draft thing without um, having to, you know, be on the ice or anything like that. So, yeah. And that I don't know be... if Bedard's going to be able to talk. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that'll be interesting that draft on the Thursday. Yeah. Night, the, mm-hmm. the um, I'm sure. Uh, Justin Bieber is probably going to try and get all the leaves on (laughs) on one team if he can, but I don't know. We'll see how it works out. And now it's time to get into the show. As Chris mentioned off the top, it's been a bit of a rough stretch for the Leafs and a lot for us to talk about. So we're changing up our regular programming and covering it all in a Leafs Talk segment. For the third period, we're excited to have senior host and producer for the Winnipeg Jets, Sarah Orleski, as our guest with the Leafs playing a rare home at home versus the Jets this week. Sarah gives us an idea of what we will see from the Jets and shares some insights on her career with TSN and now with the Winnipeg Jets. So without any further ado, let's talk Leafs. Okay, so inconsistency has been the theme for this season um, for this team. Uh, I I mean, I only went, I mean, I went back further, but I was going back to the end of December. They had the losses versus the, uh, to the Sens, the Columbus Blue Jackets and the Carolina Hurricanes. And then they went out West on the California road trip and they won three in a row. Obviously it's a bit of a different caliber of team, obviously for them, except for the Kings, the LA Kings are doing well this year. Um, but yeah, and then, but then they lost four in a row, <laughs> um, I guess, including the loss to the Oilers. So it's like up and down. And then they got the win versus the Flames. And then they lost again to the Canucks last night. Um, we're recording this on the Sunday. So, um, yeah, throughout all this, there's been a lot of questions uh, starting off with Keefe's coaching status. And then Mitch Marner has been in the spotlight with his comments after the game versus the Oilers. There's goaltending issues that have been going on all year long. And then special teams have been a, a huge concern. So, um, yeah, where do we want to start? I guess are we going to start with Keith and his? Yeah, let's, uh, let's start there start with that. Yeah, because yeah. that's been the biggest topic. All, mm-hmm. I mean, for me, like at the beginning of the season, I said I wanted to hopefully see some. Like, I mean, obviously, give him a month or so, October into, I guess, before they went to Sweden. I was hoping to find some set lines, but this guy doesn't believe in set lines, and now he's saying things like the. Um, the comment that he had that he's not sure who he can trust now after 42 games and we're just at the halfway point of the season and he doesn't know who to put out there to get the job done and I'm thinking to myself after 42 games you like it's basically just your core five group of players that's who you trust basically in the end and I I I didn't like that comment at all I don't know what no I I agree. I think that's something that if, if you feel that way, that's fine. But basically you're just putting your chips out there for everyone to see, like, or your cards, yeah. right? So, yeah. uh, I don't know. I kind of feel like with his, t- I, I was hoping, I think we go back to the beginning of the season. I was saying that, you know, without his buddy Dubas there, it's going to be interesting to see if he can become his, his own man and, um, just, you know, I wanted to see some growth in him um, as a coach, you know, to come into his own. Um, I feel like I haven't really seen that. And as far he's as like, couple of, he's done a couple, I guess a couple of different things to do with like benching. Certain yeah. Play, like, but that's whatever. not necessarily but a growth as opposed, thing. I no, mean, that's something maybe thing, he wouldn't have done if Dubas was yeah. still here potentially, yeah. but yeah. The, it hasn't really worked. No, mind you. Um, but I kind of feel like, uh, He's just such an intense guy, and I sort of feel like uh, the reason he makes like is always doing the blender is because he can't do anything on the ice. So the only way he has feels like he has any control over the outcome is by you know you know mixing every mixing people up, and he is just so quick to pull the trigger because he can't he doesn't have 
the patience. I think that's required to stick with some of these options to let his guys figure things out. Like, yeah, yeah like how what he said how is right. He doesn't trust people, and that yeah. shows. How, yeah. Well, I mean, right from the start of the season too, with his experiment with Nylander being a mm-hmm. center. How long did that last? No, Three I know. Days. It's like, it, if it doesn't work, okay, well, we're done. Like, you know, like he yeah. doesn't let them, you know, figure it out. And, and that's, and now it's that's ha- not good for the growth of the player either, frankly. No. Because no, they are, he's not allowing them to work through adversity. And when mm-hmm. do you have to work through adversity? Hello, in mm-hmm. the playoffs. So yeah. if they're not allowed to practice this in game for, for stretches, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Now it's almost too late to be able to do anything that way mm-hmm. because we're, well, yeah. you know, in a tough spot and every game yeah. counts. So yeah, there's not much, much left of the season anymore. And he's not going to have as much runway to, to make, you know, to be able to work these things out. But I don't know. It's a combination of, of him and the way he is, but also the roster construction is not great. So like I, I see, I, I understand what he what he's saying and what he feels about not having the guys to work with, but at the same time, there's there's assets he's not really using. It's like he needs to mm-hmm. sit Geo more, for example. Lagason yeah. and Benoit were great together at, at the beginning when we were winning most of our games. Those two guys yeah. were together, and they were together mostly because they had to be because of injuries, but. Mm-hmm. If it's working, why, why is Gio not having like a couple nights off so that he can have some load management and get Lagason in there? Yeah. He's not going to no, hurt I, you I, because he's a stay at home guy. He literally yeah. doesn't do anything else except yeah. for keep stuff out of the net. Yeah, no. And, um, like you're saying about the adversity and, and with the, I guess the players that Trilliven got, like being Domi and Bertuzzi and, and even Matthew Nyes, it's his first season as a, as a pro. And like you're saying, he's not letting those players work through the adversity through the beginning of the season. He's playing them, um, well, in the, we'll put Nyes in a separate section because he's on the top line or he was on the top line, but I mean, Bertuzzi and, and Domi, especially like he's playing like eight minutes, nine minutes a night. And I felt bad for Domi last night. There was that Zadorov that he's like six foot six and he got like labeled. Mm-hmm. But then, I mean, I've, it was good. He tried to, he kind of just bounced off of him when he went to hit him. So anything right at the, to get back at him. But you can tell Domi is frustrated as well. Like that he's, he's not, he hasn't been given the opportunity mm-hmm. really to, like to, I guess, mesh and, and build some chemistry with with a third line. We have no third line. It's ridiculous. And then no, we're I And I mean, we're halfway through the season. Like, when are we going to have a third line? Like, it's, it's, and that to me is the coach. Like, it's just, he's, it's, it's not <laughs> happening right now for him to, to, like the way he's, I guess the way he's approaching the team as, as with his players, he's not, he hasn't been building that relationship to, to, to mm-hmm. allow them to grow and to get a, a line. Right. It, so and I think I, I said this before too. It really reminds me of Nick nurse last year with the Raptors. Mm-hmm. He didn't trust anybody. And ultimately they didn't go anywhere and he got fired. And that same thing's going to happen to Keith. If like, yeah. If, if they get to the end of this and we either don't make the playoffs or we just don't do anything, he's done. But I don't know. It's, yeah. it's, I, yeah. the other question, Nick Robertson, you know, like yeah. what has he done that is so egregious? Like when he's played, have like, have like goals been going in left, right and center? Like has it been so horrible? I seem to recall, recall that we did win games when he was in the lineup. So. Yeah. Literally, like that's one of the games that he I thought he should have played was against the Oilers because that's a game where speed can make a huge difference, you know, Mm -hmm. to be able to get the puck up off up up the ice, right? Mm -hmm. And they should have played him that game. Instead, they opted not to, and you know, we see we see what the result was. I'm not saying that if Nick Robertson was in, we would have won that game, but you know, you need to look at the strengths of your players and realize, you know. 
what are the good days to put them in? Like the, what he has done, I, I don't understand why he's like in such a, in the doghouse. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. And it's, I mean, I guess, I don't know who, who's he put in instead of, oh, I guess it's Holmberg that mm -hmm. kind of has become the, um, <laughs> coach's favorite person now. I mean, he has yeah. been playing well. Um, but I mean, I still question like how all of a sudden he's on the top line and Nyes yeah, is I, now I, on I don't the third think that's line. warranted. Like, yeah. Like how, like, has he played that well in the number of games mm. that he's had to, um, like to, to be playing with Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, I and mean, of course, I, every, I get, I guess, I don't know. He's had, I think he's had seven points in seven games that he's, mm -hmm. that he's played from what I, what I remember hearing earlier, but I don't know. I just think it's it, it, nice. Yes. He's, I mean, he's playing on a, a it's a totally different role, basically being on a third line. Mm -hmm. And yes, he did make the screw up last night versus the Canucks where, um, like he didn't get it out along the boards. Like he, like, and they end up getting, they were already tired, the group of five that were on there. And, and it resulted in like the fourth goal. I think it mm -hmm. was the, the go ahead goal for the Canucks. But yeah, I, th I think that he's hoping that Nice finds some more offense as well. Yeah. And maybe, that's what wasn't happening on the top line for him. But this is his first, first year yeah. in the league. And to switch his, switch gears for him halfway through the season, I think is, is asking an awful lot yeah. for him yeah. to be able to adapt that quickly and as a not, rookie to that. He's not going to get more points that I can't see how he's going to get more points that way. But I don't, he's playing, I don't see so he's playing less minutes mm -hmm. and he needs to build a chemistry with those players too, mm -hmm. right? You can't just, I don't know. I, and then you have Robertson sitting on the sidelines that he actually was getting points on the third line. Mm -hmm. And then he's sitting in the press box for the last few games. I mean, it's not to say that he's Robertson is like you're saying, like you said, that it's, they would win the game versus the Oilers or, but I don't know. I, ju I just don't see how Keith's decision making that way. I, I just don't agree with it. But let's move on. Because <laughs> we could stay. I mean, yeah. Leafs Nation have been talking about Sheldon Keith um, all the time, like almost all the time. It's all over social media that way. And um, yeah. So let's move on to Mitch Marner and his comments after the uh, game versus the Oilers, um, where he said, like, they're a great team. And. Um, and I actually have it here. I, I put it in the, I took a sh screenshot of it so that I could have it on the site if I can get it here. It's David. Al okay. So yeah. So David Alter. So this is from Twitter. He asked him, uh, or X, he asked him, do you feel frustration seeping in? He was asking to Mitch Marner and he's like, Mitch Marner says no, but a lot of people on the others on the outside are trying to, to, to say that basically and it's how it goes for us we know we're doing the right things and he also said that um that they're a great team basically as part of that so i don't know i like i don't i guess you gotta take mitch, mitch is like he doesn't like talking to the media let's just say right like he's not a media guy um but i didn't mind his comments i just because i think because i'm I'm used to the way he says it. Like, mm -hmm. just like you well, can take it in different ways. And our, <laughs> one of our people on X, our followers, Marie, mm -hmm. like she mentioned, like she mentioned, like, you know, it's the accountability part. Like he could be better at that. Um, mm -hmm. and like to say that, you know, we need to be better and blah, 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 that sort of thing. Yeah, but who is, is that for? That is just to, is that just for everyone to appease? To appease us masses in Leaf Nation that we like, oh yes, okay, now, now we know that they're accountable because he said that. Yeah. I and mean, that's just lip service. It's, that is actually yeah. just a line. So, right. bottom okay. line. Yeah. Plus, doesn't he say this exact same comment sometime around this, this part of the season every year? It's like, he says <laughs> the same thing every yeah. year. Yeah. So, it, yeah. Well, I, I was just know. thinking to myself, what's he going to say? Like they're a garbage team or yeah. like they're no good? Yeah. Like you want him, is that what you'd prefer to say for yeah. him to say? Like, I don't know, right? Like he's, I, and then the media, I mean, I, I know the media, they always say, you know, oh, it's like they're always blaming us, blah, blah, blah. Or like mm -hmm. they're insinuating that it's the media thing. But I don't think it's that either. Like I think, I think, 
Like it's just Mitch. He 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 listens to social media too much. I think too, right? Mm-hmm. Or he has people in his family. Like we talked to our insider Mike. Um, he said it like his the people around him are like tell even if he's not looking at social media, like people around him are telling him about what's being said, mm-hmm. right? And he just needs to just do his thing. Like last night, what a beautiful goal he had that shorthanded mm-hmm. goal. I didn't see anybody don't see anybody complaining about that. Like on the ice, he's been fantastic lately. Right. So I don't know. I just like, if and ever he's gone, Mitch Marner, if he's ever not on this as a leaf, there's going to be a lot of people sorry for that. I think Mm -hmm. like for, for. (laughs) Yeah. I, I I mean, honestly, like it, it might help him though, to just play the game a little bit and just throw that line in there just to, you just get everybody off his back. Honestly, yeah. like yeah. that would be whoever's advising him should just mm. tell him, why don't, why don't you just, just say it, you know, that, yeah, we're not happy with how we're doing. We could be doing better. Yeah. And we're working on it and, and then say with the rest yeah. of what he said, you know, yeah. we're doing, we're doing some really good things. We need to build on that. Yeah. That's what people want to hear. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to the goaltending now. Our favorite yeah. topic of the year, I think. <laughs> yes. So it seems like Martin Jones might be reaching his expiry date. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I feel for the guy. Like he's been, you know, carrying the load uh, much more than he should have had to. And uh, now it's, you know, rearing its ugly head, so to yeah. speak. I think so. Samsonov must be playing tonight versus the yeah, captain. I would he think. has to. Yeah, he has they to. They have and to get him in there and yeah. get him more reps because uh, this guy can't, you know, as a 34-year-old, which I think he's 34, Yeah, he can't carry this team no. Like no. for the he's whole already, season. He's showing that, you mm-hmm. know, he can't be playing all yeah. these games in a row. Um, and again, it's coaching, in my opinion. Like, Keith has to... Like I would have played him versus the versus the Flames too. Like the I would have played Samsonov versus the mm-hmm. Flames after after that Oilers game just to try and work him in there, right? And then put versus the Canucks, let's just say as the as the better team over the Flames, like put he as he did, he put Jones in there, sort of thing. And then tonight go back and forth a little bit, see if you can work mm-hmm. him in. You can't expect Samsonov to be that much better after playing one game. And then not playing for like five games. <laughs> like, yeah. how, how is that better? I don't know. Well, I don't, bottom I don't line is it. he has to start trusting people. Like, yeah. th- these are the players that he has been given. And it's his job to make that work and to find yeah. the ways to get the most out of what he has. That actually is his job. Yeah. So you can't just decide that, okay, I've got these these five or six guys, these are the guys that I, I, I can work with the rest of them. I, I'm just going to throw, throw them against the wall and see what sticks. Like that's, his job is to, is to make the most of the roster. And that means that even he knows that what Samsonov is capable of. I don't know. The only right. thing I can, I can think of with that is that they just think mentally he's still really so fragile that he, you know what? And we're losing well. anyways, so who cares? Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, because he did play, Samsonov played well in that game versus the Red Wings. He did. That was his last. The and loss like, is not on him. And no. I, I've heard lots of, there's some uh, a goalie, um, used to be in the Leafs system that was on TSN this week, and they were talking about that exact thing. And yeah. he basically said that as a goalie, you can't look at the loss. Like, you have to look at, how you played personally and, yeah. and that yeah. is what you look at and build on. And the, yeah. the, the, a loss, you can't put that on yourself. So you yeah. have to, you know, move on from that, yeah. that part and of Sam's the thinking. Not, he, I actually liked his comments after that game. Mm-hmm. Like he seemed to be con- like building a confidence anyways, mm-hmm. right? Like it was his first game after so many. And, um, but how are you playing? supposed to continue to build on that no, if exactly. you never get back in the lineup? Yeah. No, I know. And, and now tonight he's, it's a week later now. So, I mean, mm-hmm. you can't, I don't know. Again, it's, and it's that trust factor, like you said, between the player and the coach. And mm-hmm. how is that going to make Samsonov feel 
to say that the coach doesn't trust him. Let's just say the next yeah. time he's going in, right? Like it's, I don't know. We'll see tonight versus the Kraken. As, I just want to say as a, as a, as a coach, I have coached people right in a, you know, another lifetime or whatever. Um, <laughs> you can't let your, your players or the person that you're coaching know that you don't believe in them either. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that's all Keith is doing lately is basically putting it out there constantly, hoping to motivate people by telling them that I don't think that you're, that I don't believe in you right now. I don't trust you. So, <laughs> so it's a good thing Mitch came out and said that they believe in themselves because the coach sure is not that's showing that these days. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. All right. And then, uh, it's not the final thing, but the final, because we, there are a lot of other topics that we could get into actually mm -hmm. over the last couple of weeks, but the special teams have been a big concern. Um, I mean, we talked about the power play. That was my bad. Uh, the, uh, on our last uh, episode in the good, bad and the ugly. I, uh, so we won't get too much into the power play. They're still having issues getting into the, uh, I guess the main issue is to get into the ozone that way that um, they haven't been, but the PK, oh my God, that's been, <laughs> it's basically killing us. Like mm -hmm. they basically, they, uh, if we can't score on the power play and then we can't keep it out, out of our net uh, on the, on the PK and like the only difference in the players from last year on our PK um, are Justin Hall, um, Alexander Kerfoot and Pierre Engvall. Right before the trade deadline, right? So we had him on the team. And I don't know, those three players, like they were that detrimental to us. Um, like all of a sudden now we don't know how to penalty kill anymore. <laughs> like it just, uh, I, I, it's, it's it, to be bottom five in the league on the PK, like that's bad. Yeah. And we have the same coaches too. Yeah. The same coaches that were allotted last year by, you know, doing such a great job mm -hmm. creating the system and, you know, they're so aggressive and all of that. Um, so I don't, do they forget yeah. how to coach all of a sudden? Yeah. I don't know. I think the main thing that is wrong with it and or a big part of it, again, it goes back to the whole trust factor is that he is not keeping together or has not cultivated some set pairs either on for, for the, the D or uh, the forward group that is involved in the penalty kill. Like he's got different, like that, I guess the, the closest would be maybe Mitch and Kempf. They're kind of the mainstay, but yeah. as far as anybody after that, it's just like a revolving door. So yeah. how are they supposed to, you know, get set plays and, and be able to be aggressive and, and assert themselves if, uh, if they're not comfortable necessarily with, with their group on yeah. the ice. And, and then of course you have Giordano out there who's 40 years old yeah. playing, playing too many minutes or too many right. games basically. Mm -hmm. He needs that load management, like you said earlier. And he's getting the bad bounces. They're always seeming mm -hmm. to go off of his skate or into the net or So I don't he's know. this this year's Justin Hall on yeah. the penalty kill. <laughs> Although Justin Hall is great on the penalty kill though. That's the one thing that he did really do well. Yeah. So Yeah, but I mean Gio obviously he was he was good last year too. He was mm -hmm. on the he did penalty killing last year too, but it's yeah, and he blocks, obviously he's like the shot blocker yeah. king and all of that. But he's but, a year older now and he mm -hmm. had the injury, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, so he's still sort of a step behind. He's a step behind and and that's Keith should recognize that. Like and 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 like manage it basically better in in, in a way and and like hopefully he's not playing tonight. I don't know. We'll see what happens with Seattle. Um, with with Giordano, but uh, yeah, no, the it needs to be better. Definitely, special teams are huge. They always kill us in the playoffs, and it's killing us right now in the regular season. Well, while the Leafs have been inconsistent this season, one Canadian team that's been rolling along is the Winnipeg Jets. And now it's time for a third period segment, and we have our guest, Sarah Orleski, to talk everything Jets. So the Leafs have a couple of games coming up versus the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, and for our third period segment, we want to welcome senior host and producer for the Winnipeg Jets, Sarah Orleski. 
So many fans know Sarah from her time as the Jess reporter on TSN, as well as TSN sideline reporter for the CFL's Winnipeg Blue Bombers. She now works with the Jets and is giving fans a glimpse of what players are like off the ice with behind the scenes team content across all Winnipeg Jets platforms. Sarah produces a post game show for the Jets and is the lead content creator of documentary projects on the Winnipeg Jets as well. So a very, very busy lady. Uh, welcome <laughs> to the show, Sarah. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. All right. All right. So, um, yeah, so the Jets right now doing really well. Uh, first in the Central Division and, um, yeah, quite the turnaround from how it ended all last season, that's for sure. So in their last 25 games, uh, ending with the game versus the Islanders uh, just la- this past week, they are 18, 5, and 2, uh, and one of the hottest teams in the NHL. So what do you think has been the main reason for the Jets' uh, success this season, and, and what can we expect from the Jets' play when they face the Leafs uh, in the home-and-home home series coming up? Well, I think that a lot of people have this upcoming home-and-home home series earmarked. I mean, really, any time you have a all-Canadian matchup, they do, but especially, I think there's always something special, as I'm sure... People uh, know whenever yeah. the Leafs play any team, um, the opposing team, the fans always look forward to it. It's that love-hate sort of relationship that goes on with it. <laughs> so everyone looking for bragging rights, especially I think for recent years when you go back to the whole Austin Matthews, Patrick Laine from years ago, I think that really upped. Um, that really upped the the rivalry a little bit as well. Or looking for bragging rights. This Jets team is really, uh, I, I like I'll say straight up that it has surprised me uh, this season. I did not expect them to be producing at the level that they have in, in playing. I thought that they could be a good team. I really like the coaching staff and what they were trying to implement. But you mentioned, I mean, the way that things ended last year with their um, first round de- departure from the playoffs, the Vegas Golden Knights, Rick Bonus had some comments at the very end that were, you know, very, very brief, but yeah. stern. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so certainly sent a message um, to the group, but they made changes in the off season and the biggest difference, and I've covered this team since day one in Winnipeg. And the biggest difference with this group I find is, is really the makeup of it. Um, in terms of not only do I feel like everyone's pulling in the same direction, which you didn't necessarily have before, they really just embody a team. You're getting contributions from all four lines, which has made a huge difference because this team is, although they have you know, in some ways they've been healthy. They, they've never had their, um, ideal lineup in place for more than a couple games at the beginning of the season because they lost Gabe Velarde, who came over in a trade this summer. They lost him early on for weeks. Kyle Connor just returned mm-hmm. to the lineup. Yeah. And he was your leading goal scorer. I mean, you think he was out for five weeks. He was still their leading goal scorer when he came back. So this is really a team that's been doing everything by committee. Um, and, I just, there is a feeling around this team that I have not experienced before with the Jets since they've returned in 2011. And they're just, they are a hardworking team. They are a really likable group, guys that seem to get along really well. And they just, they have bought into the system that Rick Bonus and his coaching staff have really preached. It was always, and you hear, it doesn't matter what market you're in, you'll always hear coaches say, Good defense leads to offense, and you need to get them um, to believe that and to partake in that. And that's something that we didn't always see in the past. And if you've got those offensive, uh, those highly offensive players, like the Jets do in some of them with the Kyle Connors, the Mark Shifleys, sometimes it can be difficult, I think, to get players to buy into that because what's Mm -hmm. more fun, playing defense or scoring goals? Obviously, we all, you know, I I don't play (laughs) hockey, but I'm going to presume scoring goals. Um, but they just, they have, they've all, they've been really connected as a five-man unit out on the ice. And you just, it is certainly, it's paid off for them. And they they have just found ways to win. When adversity hits, this is a team that dig, dig, digs deep. And you just, you never get the sense that they're out. It could be three minutes left in the game and you still go, okay, there's still time. So uh, is there any trepidation because considering like last year around this time they were clicking really well and they were doing really well and they were at the the top of the standings as well. And then things just kind of fell off completely towards the end of the season. So, um, which probably leads to your surprise at the beginning that they're doing so well, but is there like any kind of trepidation or kind of uneasiness as to whether or not they're going to pull this out? Or do you really sense that this team is different this year? 
you know, I just feel that it's different. Last year, you got the sense that when uh, some losses started to pile up, when there were two losses, three losses, there wasn't, it didn't always look like a game that was sustainable. This year, it does. So when, I mean, you don't often see them win or lose a couple of games in a row, or we haven't um, since November, but you don't get the sense that this is going to change. They ha- they are playing the right way. And even in the most recent games, you know, the details maybe haven't been quite as sharp, but that I attribute more to fatigue um, than I do anything else. You don't get the guys aren't going rogue. They don't look like they're on their own game plan here. It's so this is a team and that's bought in and the changes that they made in the off season, they traded Pierre-Luc Dubois. They bought out their former captain, Blake Wheeler, the, on the Dubois trade, three players come over. They have fit in well. Adam Lowry is their captain now. And it's just, everything just seems like it has fit. So no, I don't, I don't get any of that sense of trepidation. Now, will they finish first in the central or will they continue to be, you know, you look at the points percentage and I haven't checked this morning, but points percentage, they were um, still leading the league. So at this point in time, I mean, with every night you get two games, you get two nights yeah. off in a row and all of a sudden you're exactly all of a sudden yeah. you're sitting third or fourth. And if you were to go by league standings, but I just, I, whether they'll finish that high means to be seen because of how close it is. But do I have any concern about this group having the almost historical drop off that they did <laughs> last year? No, I don't. You just, it just feels different. All right. So um, next question. So you've touched on this a teeny bit talking before, but so it's been a little while since Mark Shifley addressed his teammates back in the locker room in 2021, where he boldly exclaimed, hey, boys, is there anything better than beating the Leafs? (laughs) So so in the past couple of years, it seems like there's always been a little bit of that extra jam when these two teams play. So do you think that there is a true rivalry growing between the Jets and the Leafs? I don't know if there's a true rivalry in the sense of um, when I look at, I mean, is this, is this going to be, you know, ever the equivalent of Leafs and Bruins? No, I mean, you only Mm -hmm. see each other twice a year and, and everything, but do I think that there's always going to be a rivalry when it comes to wanting to beat the Leafs? I think any team is cliche. I think any team, any Canadian team wants to beat the Leafs, partly just because of the, the attention that's paid to those games, right? So obviously, with, especially with this home and home series, you know that a lot of eyes are going to be on these games, whether it's you're covering the Leafs. And so you're wanting to see whether or not they're able to turn things around and have get on a roll, whether or not you're the Jets of being able to say, okay, you know, can you keep the, can you keep the good times going the way that they have been? But I just think there's so many eyes on these series that, um, in these games that I think that they get excited but i don't know if uh, beyond that i don't know if there's a true rivalry that same way um just that i think that canadian matchups always they just they bring something a different element to them because i know that it you know there are always leafs fans travel well um and you find them in every market you find jets fans in every market so i i just think it adds that extra dimension everyone wants bragging rights <laughs> yeah, the true true rivalry, I guess, with the Jets is with the Minnesota Wild, right? Oh, well, isn't that the truth? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you start if you start going, I mean, what do they always say, right? Rivalry is born from the playoffs and yeah. and then it carries over into it. And there's certainly the the games between the Minnesota Wild and the Winnipeg Jets have certainly been heated in in recent years. One thing I wanted to ask you too about Mark Shifley since he came up. He's an Ontario boy, obviously. Mm-hmm. Is he uh is he a Leafs fan deep down? <laughs> you know, we always like these the, the, the these players. Is they there always a picture like of him? Us, like John, right? yeah, is there a of him like John Tavares not, and leaves? It back. hasn't surfaced yet. No, that's so. right. They're very <laughs> his parents are very smart with it. No, yeah. um, you know what? I think that he was uh, he loved um, Steve Eiserman. He was huge mm. Steve Eiserman fan. Yeah, but is there something special for any any Ontario player um, mm. I that I've spoken to um, and asked about it? There's always something special about going back and playing. Right, you get to play in front yeah. of uh, you get to play in front of your family, your friends, and then again, whether you grew up a Leafs fan or not, with as many eyes on those games as possible, you always want to go out and have a good showing. Yeah. 
All right. So um, the NHL All-Star Game is coming up soon in Toronto in a couple of weeks and uh, uh, from February 1st to the 3rd. And Rick Bonus has been named one of the coaches for the for the Western Conference, which is great. And Connor Hellebuck is obviously representing the uh, Jets. So we just wanted to get your thoughts on the All-Star Game. Um, like, do you think the players will be more into it because the like, do you get any feedback that way, like because of the prize money that is up for grabs in the skills competition? Or what do you think, I guess, of the whole all-star format, like your opinion on on that? Look, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm not a huge all-star person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, I, I, I appreciate um, that, especially the importance of it in terms of of your sponsors, as well as if it's in your market, it's a yeah. little bit of a different feel. I I always, I mean, am I the type that sits at home watching it? Not really. No. Um, but I, I like the skills portion usually more than the game. But I feel that way about any All Star game in any sport. Um, you obviously don't, you know, it's it's a little bit different. But I do think that it's a great idea if you're going to do it. I mean, give added incentive to it because I don't think that the same incentive was there as. Um, you know, with the NBA, you see players that really want to go and, and it becomes a big show. And I, and I just feel as if, um, over the years, when you listen to players, a lot of players, as much as you'd love to be an all-star, would you love those four days off a little bit more? Probably <laughs> at yeah. times. So I think it's good. But what I actually, I'm meaning to keep look at it. I know that you can win the million dollars. A skater, what do you get as a goalie? Do you know? Yeah, that's a good question. I have no idea. I don't yeah. know. I kept looking, trying to see. I'm yeah. like, okay, so that's great that a skater can get the million dollars. So if you're someone like Connor Hellebuck, what does he get? <laughs> What's his option for for being yeah. able to get in there? So that's something that's on my list of things that I need to actually right. see what um, what it is. But I do think, Check that, out, yeah, yeah. But I do think that giving an incentive two players like that is a good way to do it. Because if you're going to go there, you want the players to be as engaged as possible. And I don't think it matters, um, you know, how much money you make. Million dollars is a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. So on the topic of the fans, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing with the Winnipeg Jets and how you are working, you know, towards giving the fans more of a connection to the team? Well, it's one of the things that appealed to me most when, you know, it wasn't an easy decision to make the move over from TSN um, to work for the team. But uh, obviously, my connection um, with the team probably made it a little bit easier having again, having been there since day one um, and having hosted the broadcast for uh, since the very beginning as well, because TSN's always had the regional rights. Um, so but one thing that I really wanted to do was help create more of a connection between um, the fans and the team. And I think that one of the easiest ways or one of the most natural ways to do that is to give them a better sense of who the players are away from the ice. I think that you look at the way that content is distributed now and the way that people, even fandom, the way that's evolved. It, you just you want to know more and more about the players, about your team, feel a different type of connection to them, and so um, and that's something that I felt in this market, much like Toronto. I mean, the, Winnipeg it's such an incredibly passionate Jets um, market, and I said even if you don't want to follow hockey, you have no choice but to know what's mm -hmm. going on with Winnipeg yeah. just pretty much by osmosis and by hearing any, because everyone's talking about them all the time. So um, one of the things that we've done is we've started a behind the scenes series, uh, which I know that the Leafs have had for a little while as well. Um, so to try to, and we're following along this season with them. So to, to try to give um, fans more of a, of a chance to see what goes on it, throughout the season, but again, behind the closed doors for it with player interviews. And then also just doing player features that take them that don't talk hockey. Because the guys get, that's really what they get asked about all the time, right? And there's so many people that are chiming in on um, or breaking down and analyzing what's gone right, what's gone wrong in their games. But one thing that we don't always see is that the players are people. And I think that sometimes just across sports, I think that's something that as fans, that sometimes it's easy unfortunately to forget is that the they are people they you know the that whether it be the the critical words or the 
stresses with families or being a parent or various things, they deal with those too. Um, and so it's just trying to give fans a better understanding of the players and uh, what the what they're like away from the ice so that maybe they can continue to love their jets, but um, also just learn about them in different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I think that's um, super important. Yeah. <laughs> that, we, uh, we really want more and more of that all the time as fans, right, Chris? Yeah. Yeah. I like the, I think it's called home ice, right? The mm-hmm. one where you're, you're, I watched a little bit of, of one of the episodes with uh, Adam Larry. Oh yeah. At the dog yeah. park. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that was, that was cool. I, th- I thought that would be something good that the le- Leafs don't really do that part of it. Like to have it in a, in that type of setting. They do it yeah. with their, their alumni. I've seen some stuff with their alumni, but not with the, not with the current players. So I thought that was really cool. And I watched an ep- your last episode of The Runway too, um, that you have for the, that's similar to the Leafs blueprint. Yes. The way they do the blueprint. So, um, yeah. So th- yeah, no, they're both, uh, they're both great. You're very busy with that. That's <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, you know what, but when you see them, so with Winnipeg, I mean, do- it's joke, and I'm sure it's very similar to Toronto. But I mean, Winnipeg is such it's such a fishbowl, right? And you you look, it's it is um, it's still a small city, and so these guys they they get recognized everywhere they go, and they want. But we also want to show that they have there's a perception of the city of Winnipeg and and players, right? So mm-hmm. of players not wanting to play in Winnipeg, and yes, it's cold. Yes, we get that everything but there's also there's a lot to love about the city and so we want to show that the players um have a connection with the city as well so the adam lowry one uh you know yeah. i said to him when i had pitched him on the idea and the guys are have been really receptive to it but when i pitched him I, said, I go what do you usually like to do around the city because to be honest because i spend so much time at the dog park I'm sold let's go to a dog park <laughs> so to the dog park we to the dog park we went and uh, had a drone out there with us and sat in lawn chairs and and everything oh, so cool. yes yeah, William, so William Nylander likes the dogs too so <laughs> maybe need, <laughs> there you go they should get together maybe. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah it's um anyways it's just yeah like I said it's just it's been fun to show them um way and and the guys what's been receptive is when I say we I don't want to talk hockey I don't want to. I don't want to break down everything. I just want to talk about stuff that interests you outside of it. Cool. All right. Well, we're going to get into a little bit more of that as well because now we're going to move on to our for the fans Q and A portion, and we're just going to ask you just well, they're not really rapid fire, but just some like short questions about various different things, but more to do with you, the fan, and uh, a little bit more about uh, maybe the players the fan as well so um chris take it away all right so first question we have for you who's more passionate winnipeg cfl fans or winnipeg hockey fans Ooh, well there's a lot of crossover <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so i feel like you're you're both in this city it was i feel that you can be in so i'll just keep going back to um toronto that you can be much more segmented in your fan base yeah. um winnipeg the everybody again much like i said that even if you don't follow the jets you know what's going on with them even if you don't follow football you know what's going on with them because everybody talks jets everybody talks bombers so i'd say that they are both um although the obviously football and jets viewing experiences are different given the the natures of the sports they are both equally passionate people love the bombers and people love the jets (laughs) we we get that you don't want to yeah you don't want to upset too many people (laughs) (laughs) because you're connected with both teams (laughs) very diplomatic answer yeah so we'll let it go So did you follow sports as a kid? And and if so, can you point to any moments that influenced your path towards working in sports? So I always did. Um, I used to always watch sports with my dad. I'd go out, um, I mean, from a young age, I'd go out and watch him play, you know, rec hockey, but we'd sit and in particular, we'd watch a lot of football together. So from the time I was probably early teens, I, it was always a career in sports broadcasting that I was hoping for um, and planning on. And it was sitting watching a football and in particular, so watching the halftime interviews with the sideline reporters and, and going, oh, that's so cool. They get to be at the sporting event. That's amazing. Um, and so, you know, I look at 
moments like that. Um, Hannah Storm used to cover the NBA on NBC back kind of during the um, early 90s watching watching her on that as well. And I just knew from a young age, I never wanted to be um, a sports anchor in terms of doing a highlight show. With, so I, at TSN, um, there are so many fantastic sports anchors that do a tremendous job with the highlights and the and sports center. But that was never something that I wanted to, I always wanted to be at the game. I didn't want to be in the studio talking about games that had occurred. I wanted to be right there. And so that started again from a young age and I went to university and started covering sports and working then in the industry while I was still um, at university. I had my first job in television before I'd finished my degree um, at Simon Fraser in BC and uh, it's just kind of continued from there. But it was definitely, was sitting watching football with my dad that I would say is being pivotal moments and and sitting and talking to them. And I still, mm. I call, I'm in my 40s. I call and talk to my dad after most games. Um, yeah. And I'll say both parents, because otherwise, I mean, <laughs> my mother will get offended by it. But even at this age, but they, um, but I'll call and I would break down, they'll watch everything. And I would break down games with my dad or um, yeah. same with whether it be football. So mm. it's certainly there's big influence in my life. Mm-hmm. That's cool. All right. So, and who would you say was your biggest mentor in broadcasting? Oh, I've had a number. I mean, I've had a number that have helped me out that were behind the scenes in terms of producers. But um, you know what? So when I started my career, I was in Vancouver and I just, I always say that I was so fortunate. So I was working in local television and I was, I was the weekend sports uh, originally started as the weekend sports producer and then I was the weekend sports anchor but I would go to all of the Canucks games or the Lions games and even though I wasn't getting paid for it I would go because they would just send a camera and I wanted to just be around the environment I wanted to learn um, observe and say that there were just there were so many people within the Vancouver sports community whether it be writers on air uh, broadcasters that helped me out so much that really took me under their wing. I was 22 years old. I always say look like I was 16. Um, so <laughs> it was, and, but, and trying desperately to prove to people that I just, that this was, I was so serious about this job. This is what I wanted to do. And it was a group that just took me, as I said, writers or, or on air that took me under their wing as if I was kind of the little sister that they that they helped along. And so I, I owe so much to so many people for it. And then once, um, a big for me too, was always the support of people like Chris Cuthbert before I even joined TSN. I remember him saying to me, when are you going to come work with us and, and cover football? And I went, oh, anytime you'll have me, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and so the opportunity to, to work with, um, people like that. But one of the big things, to be honest, ladies that I, that I found was that whether it be people within the industry or coaches, I just, I experienced so much support that I found that going in. So from uh, the going in and asking questions that people are always so receptive. I always say, I do not know, you know, the, you talk to the coaches in either, I mean, football or hockey, which those being the two sports that I've covered the most, um, you know, they've forgotten more than I'll ever know about it. But going in there with the open mind going, look, I'm just trying to understand. Can you explain to me? So, you know, I've gone to coaches before and you've spoken about this sort of defense or you've talked about this, but can you explain to me? Cause I just, you know, I've looked online. I just can't quite figure out what you're meaning by it. And I've had so many coaches that have been, that have stepped up to whiteboards, um, and said, okay, so, you know, so I, this player goes this way and what we mean is this and that. And it's just helped me so much. So I just, I feel as if the support that I've had um, from the first day I walked in has been immense. Yeah. I can see well, Paul Maurice doing that. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> and, and so many. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know what, there was, so there was a, I mean, it wasn't hockey later, but there was a, a CFL coach, Doug Barry, who was known for being um, a very, 
abrasive, cantankerous <laughs> sort of person. <laughs> and, and he would take me and then same thing. He would stand there and he'd say, okay, this is our defense. This is, you know, when we call this, this is what this player does through the A gap. This is what this means. And I just, I feel that my, I just feel as if so many people, I don't know if they looked and said, okay, she obviously, she's serious about this and just wants to learn. I didn't try to put on airs that I knew everything about it. And I've said that to players too. I've tried, I've said to, I mean, Mark Shifley and I've had the conversation before where I said, if I'm asking you these questions, I'm not trying to be antagonist with it. Legitimately explain to me why, because sometimes, you know, we'll look at something on a replay and go, oh, player X. I mean, look at that blown coverage. And then you talk to the coach or you talk to the player and then go, actually, that was not my responsibility. If you go back to the neutral zone where it really broke down was because player Y didn't do this. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily know that, or you don't have yeah. the vantage point based on what the replays are. So I just think asking questions, um, it's just all about trying to gain more knowledge and people have always seemed to be receptive to that. That's a very long winded answer. For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what that, but the fact that you are open that way and so open to, to getting those answers that probably helps you cultivate that relationship and that, that trust. So they're like willing to like, you know, tell you these things and it makes you better for it. You know, you, you, your coverage is that much better. So it's, yeah. it's just like a really good relationship. It sounds like. Yeah. Well, and, and that's it, right? Is that my entire purpose is to, I, I want to be accurate, obviously with the information. And mm -hmm. so give me, you, you'll hear players that don't get upset or you hear coaches that get upset and, oh, the media doesn't know what they're talking about or, oh, this, okay, well then inform us. That's my mm -hmm. biggest thing. So you can't complain about it if you're not going to be willing to educate. So I'm like, mm -hmm. educate me. I would love to. Uh, and I try to, then that's, so that's my big thing is I want to be able to understand more. And sometimes again, it's easy to make presumptions on stuff, but you don't have the whole picture in front mm -hmm. of you. And so that, I just think that gives a bigger or better understanding, um, whether you're able to use it that day or going forward, things to look out for. Okay. So um, sort of on that similar vein and, and, and you know, with what you do behind the scenes, let's get a little bit behind the scenes. And, and so who is, you know, the best or some of the best players to interview on the team? And is there an interview or segment that you have done or produced that you are particularly proud of with respect to the Jets? Um, well, I, I mean, I'm very proud of the runway series that we do um, because that's the one that's similar to Blueprint um, in the idea. It, it just, it's a whole lot of work <laughs> with a very yeah. small crew. So it's, <laughs> it's a tremendous amount of time and, and effort to try to go through it, but we have a, a great crew that's working on it, but it's, so that's the one that from a creative standpoint that I'm, I'm very proud of it. And I think that we just, we've continued to elevate it and give um, fans a, a better understanding of the team. Um, so it would probably be that one. As for players, if there's so many different ones. You know, I used to always joke that a player would get traded and I'd get disappointed about it and people go, oh, well, he hasn't been doing anything. I go, yeah. <laughs> I don't look at it from that perspective, though. I'm just looking, is this person a good interview? <laughs> That's all that I want <laughs> because certain players obviously are much better at not only articulating their thoughts, but being able to break down and provide you um, with analysis that that is not as superficial as we got to get the puck in deep, we got to play yeah. for six minutes, every cliche that we all know so well. Um, and the Winnipeg Jets have a lot this year. Um, in the past, you know, some of the struggles that I found was that some of their best interviews were people that were players from the third or fourth line that didn't really have those significant roles or significant ice time. So it was difficult to go to them in challenging times because you'd say, well, I mean, you only played six minutes. To, I mean, it's not fair to go <laughs> yeah. to ask what yeah. went wrong when, when <laughs> you'd been on the bench for a lot of it. But this year, um, I just feel that there are a number of players, Adam Lowry, um, you know, will always be, uh, at a, the top of a list for me or in, in the top three for it. Cause I, he just does a great job of giving thoughtful answers um, and is really self-reflective and, and we'll call a spade a spade, which is great. Um, but there, 
that's I mean, I think that there are a lot this year where you can go from the first or the fourth line. They're all contributing different ways and they all have um, players on each line that you can look at and say, okay, great. You give me something else. Cause I used to, I make no bones, but I used to say to some players, all right, we're going to go do this. Do not give me, <laughs> do not give me pecks in deep. Do not give me full <laughs> 60 minutes. Besides that, give mm-hmm. me something for yeah. it. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, as fans, we, we don't get a lot of access to players, like, especially here in Toronto. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite different, but, um, like, can you tell us and our listeners something that you may, that we may not know about some of the players on the Jets, like special skills or who's the funniest or stuff like that, I guess, like behind the scenes for the individual players? Well, I mean, an easy answer for funniest, which, um, Leafs fans, hockey fans might know, might be Nate Schmidt just because of his outgoing personality. Um, if you haven't checked out anything with Nate, I highly recommend that you do because he is just, he is a personality unlike any other. Um, so okay. he's, he's a great deal, but there's a lot that have really dry sense of humor. Um, Dylan DeMello is also, he's an Ontario boy he's got uh he's got a very dry sense of humor but very funny with it which i appreciate the dry sarcasm ideal um you know what there's just there's a whole bunch that have different um from any, quirks, superstition, so I don't know if there's any superstitions that you know for it uh, 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 oh, <laughs> they are they are not superstitious they <laughs> just have a routine oh, oh okay <laughs> well, that's what they call it right yeah, okay. that, oh yeah <laughs> The number of times over the years where I'll say, you know what, you know, any superstitions you have, oh, I'm not superstitious. I just have to put on my left skate first every time. And you go, oh, okay, but you're not superstitious. <laughs> what if you, no, no, it's just my routine. Oh, okay. So yeah. yeah, over the years I've discovered that you're much more likely to get an answer if you ask about routines versus um, superstitions. But there's, you know, there are routines. I think a lot of people have seen Connor Hellebuck. A bunch of guys go out to the bench. Like Connor Hellebuck goes out to the bench and does, you'll see his eyes dart um, back and forth. He does right. his eye training movements um, left and right. And that's always one to see. Um, Cole Perfetti, who's another Ontario um, born player, he's always out on the bench before. And Dylan DeMello goes out there and just takes it all in. And it's one of the most interesting ones that I've found. Um, to sit with and talk about it. So he'll just look around and he said to me, so I'll be out there sometimes around the time that he's out there. And he goes, yeah, I just like to look around and I'm playing in the NHL. This is pretty great, isn't it? This is pretty, and just really yeah. appreciates it. Works with a life coach and, and just is, is really appreciative of and recognizes the, the opportunities that he has and, and everything. And it is just, it's something so simple but I think it's something that you don't always see, right? You just guys get yeah. and everybody in their, in their career. And regardless of what you do, you can get caught up in the rat race and you just don't always sit back and, and reflect on things. And he just, Nope, I just like to take a look around at the arenas and just really take it in and look and go, yep, I'm in the NHL. It's yeah. pretty great. And I thought that's a pretty, yeah. that's a, you that's know, cool. regardless of whether you're in the NHL or, or anything. That's a it's a pretty great uh, lesson that I'm sure a lot of us could. I know I could certainly benefit from <laughs> stopping yeah. and taking a look around a little bit more and being appreciative of it. Well, you know, like uh, the older you get, and of course, Chris and I are of a certain age, um, <laughs> you do realize that if you blink, you can miss it, miss everything, right? So I, I actually yeah. find that really really great to hear, you know, that there's, you know, a player that's kind of being in the moment and making sure they're in the moment. And I think that probably makes them a better player overall though, too. I think so too. You know, it's one of the pieces of advice that I give people that are starting in their careers in the sports media industry. Take a stop and really appreciate is because I found that I was always just so focused on, you know, either being, getting the job done or what's next or be, making sure, okay, I have to be as successful as possible in this, that look around. I don't, I, you leave and you just haven't really absorbed what 
you've done or taken in those moments. And it's one of my biggest regrets. I don't have a lot of pictures of any of the events. I'll talk to people that will remind me of different things that have happened or events and that I've totally forgotten about. And, you know, it, or I'd be so nervous, Leon, or just anxious but wanting to make sure that I did a good job with it, that I wouldn't sit around. When TSN used to have the national rights, national NHL rights, and we did playoffs there. So we used to do a pregame interview on just before anthems on the ice. And so I'd have to walk out onto the ice in heels, not something I recommend. You want (laughs) stress that that's certainly (laughs) stressful. Um, But you would be, all the lights would be off and there would be a spotlight on you. Imagine being at Madison Square Garden and you're standing on the ice and you've got a spotlight on you as you're doing this interview beforehand. That's, that's, inc- I mean, that's incredible. That's something so few people have the opportunity to do. And I don't think that at the time I ever appreciated it as much. And I never stopped looking because it was just always about, okay, you went from one thing to another thing to another thing. And so that idea of stopping and really appreciating writing stuff down, whatever it might be is, like I said, the the piece of advice that I give people starting up because it, it can go by in the blink of an eye and and you hate to get to the end and think, oh, I didn't really, like I was there, mm-hmm. but I didn't really experience it or let myself experience it. So that would be something that if I could go back and do over that I would probably try to put a little bit more emphasis on. Well, good news is, is you got a long, long career ahead of you still, so <laughs> yeah. you can, I don't know, you can I, do I, it now. <laughs> so every day, like, have we bought a lottery? I asked my husband, did we buy a lottery ticket this week? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Sarah, we have one last question for you. And this might be, you know, the more typical one. You probably get this from anybody who doesn't live <laughs> in Winnipeg. So what is the worst thing and the best thing? about a Winnipeg winter. I wanted to end on the positive. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> the worst thing, well, I mean, let's be honest. The worst thing about a Winnipeg winter would be when it goes, th- when you go through the extreme cold snaps, the way that mm. really the entire country has been um, in the last week. But the really cold times would be the worst. When you're talking minus 40, minus mm-hmm. 45, that's, that's painful where it takes your breath away. Now, on the plus side, <laughs> I will say that although it is cold, it is always sunny. And so, um, as someone pointed out to me once, a visiting, uh, someone from a visiting team once said, it goes, yeah, but the sun's so far away. <laughs> <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't provide any heat. And I said, yeah, but it's, but it's bright. And so it's, you know, there's something to me, there's something so beautiful about seeing, you know, the, the snow around and it's, uh, if you can look through the window, if it's just, if you can be warm on the inside, but yeah. the, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things if you're an outdoorsy person that you can do here, but I just, I do appreciate that it's always bright. Having lived in Vancouver for so many years where the rain and when it can get dreary, you know, is, it's just, it, it would wear on me. Whereas at least here you go through and you go, oh, it's, it's bright out. You're not, yeah. you're not sucked in with it. So that's certainly from a winter perspective, that's definitely one of the, the pluses. Yeah. And actually, you've sold it to me yeah. right there. <laughs> yeah, because so. I guess for the last, uh, it's only this last week we've had sun before that. Mm-hmm. We had like, it was no. three weeks of like cloudy, dreary days. And, yeah. and then like, when you walk out and you notice, it's like, wow, it's sunny today. That's, that is all you need to know. Yeah. It's like <laughs> 100%. So obvious. Yeah. And that's so said when I live, when I lived in Vancouver, I mean, it was obviously it would be more rain, but I said, oh, you have the damp cold and you, and you think, oh, it's just, it's so dreary at times. It's gorgeous when it's bright and you can see everything, but it's, it can be so dreary and here it isn't. And, and because the ultimate cliche, because it is a dry cold here in Winnipeg, <laughs> um, you can, you can dress a little bit. It doesn't get into your bones the same way that, that damp cold does I used yeah. to live on Queen's Key um, mm-hmm. in Toronto, and when that wind would whip off the water, I'm, I mean, yes, it wasn't minus forty, but oh, it just it could give me a chill just mm-hmm. just thinking yeah. about it. But no, I love. I'm looking actually out a window right now, and it's just it's as bright as could be, and mm-hmm. you could look, and someone could tell you it was you know zero degrees, and you would believe it. 
Yeah, it it's, not. Nice. it's not. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's not. Yeah. But you could believe it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's hockey day in Canada too today, so mm-hmm. it's a nice, bright, sunny day for you. Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. and the Jets are in Ottawa, I think, tonight. Right? Yes, they or, are. Or this afternoon. Afternoon so, game. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That's another thing that uh, Western mm-hmm. Canada fans don't like us because of the whole timing situation. They were talking about how the Leafs are playing Vancouver tonight and. Uh, at the 4 p.m. local. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. But you know what? There is something I will say that I always appreciate when it was er- the earlier start times because I'm not a huge fan of morning skates. And so the earlier the start time, the less likely you are to have a morning skate. And there is a plus to being able to have your game done at an earlier time. And then you still have an, an evening ahead exactly. or you're able to yeah. make it home in time for dinner, whatever it is whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Sarah, for coming on the show. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor really to have, uh, somebody that's, uh, I guess works in broadcasting. We see you on TV and everything. It's, it's cool for us to, to actually have you on, on the show. And, um, yeah, thanks for taking the time. Well, yeah. I, I appreciate it very much. Anytime. And continued success uh, with your work with with the Jets um, and the Blue Bombers. Um, we'll be watching all the things you do going forward really closely. So thank you, you know, so maybe, much. Maybe a Stanley Cup final, right? Winnipeg, oh, Toronto. Could you that imagine? would definitely fuel the rivalry <laughs> if the Leafs actually no. make it there. Oh, could yeah. you imagine? What you, I mean, we, <laughs> we need can a imagine. Canadian. I know. <laughs> we need a Canadian team to, I think, if you had any Canadian team in a Cup final. But if you had two Oh, mm-hmm. it yeah. would just, yeah, it would that be unbelievable. Over the top, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So thanks again to Sarah for uh, joining us. Um, it was great just to, uh, uh, just to hear her thoughts on the Jets with the, with the home and home games that we're having um, this, this week with the, with the Leafs and the Jets playing each other and just that, it's a bit of a rivalry, I think we have. I mean, um, it's mm-hmm. uh, it's from that Canadian division, I guess, a little bit too. The time during co during the COVID time when we had that, and uh, it built built up a little bit. So yeah, I um, I really I enjoyed the conversation and just about her career too. I always watched mm-hmm. her on 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 TSN, part of the broadcast yeah. for Winnipeg. The thing that I loved hearing about the most is as a fan personally is how she is really working towards you know, um, basically giving access to fans, uh, and, you know, show, helping to, you know, bring the personality of the players out, doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Um, I think there's like a, she mentioned there's like a huge passion for, for the Jets um, there in Winnipeg and they just love their team. Um, you know, it's because it's a little bit smaller. It's, it's like, you know, they can't, the players can't really disappear into the market there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just, I just love all the things that she's doing to kind of, you know, promote and, and show off the, the players for not just being players on the ice, but for like the, the interesting human beings that they are. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so after the games that the jet with the Jets, um, the Leafs have their bye week. So another break, like we really need that, um, which runs into the All Star weekend, and they get home back home at it back at it on February fifth versus the Islanders and newly minted coach Patrick Waugh, uh verse and versus the Stars uh, the Wednesday night before going on the road again uh, for Saturday night versus the Sens. And before our next episode, they will also play the St. Louis Blues on February thirteenth. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I forgot about that, Patrick. Well, it's fairly new, I guess. Right? Yeah. For, for him to be actually. Lou thrust. snuck that in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, of course, play the Leafs, right? Um, mm-hmm. with the new coach. And I'm sure they'll, I guess they'll, uh, we'll see what happens. How interesting that's obviously Winnipeg or, um, Edmonton got the coach bump, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. to, to get going and winning 13 in a row now or whatever it is. We'll see what the Islanders, uh, get out of it. And, um, and then the stars, obviously they're one of the, the top teams in the league. And, um, yeah. And then, and then the senators, I mean, that's obviously being in Ottawa. Like, I mean, they got it. We got to start turning it around basically like right, right now before the, um, 
like after the All Star break, they hopefully people will be refreshed from wherever they <laughs> wherever the players go to uh, on the beach vacations and that. I thought it was funny. Morgan Riley said that he never goes anywhere. He rarely goes anywhere. He just stays in Toronto. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's uh, so he'll be in Toronto obviously for the All Star game. But mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah, we j- we got to start getting it. I don't know. Do you think? Like, depending on how it goes, I guess, during that time period, like, assuming that they, if they keep being inconsistent like this, like, I, I don't see them getting rid of the Keefe this season. I don't know. Like, not in season. I don't see it. I don't know. It's, I think as for Tre Living to have given him a two year extension after this year, I don't know how, like, I don't know how you, how you go and fire the guy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I suppose in, if in, it comes down from above you, but that's yeah. like, that's just, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I guess we'll see. So out of those games, I guess it's really the, it's really the senators. That's the, that's the biggest one, I guess. Um, yeah. To, to play. Cause they always like, I get, actually it's something we talked about last night uh, via text in the game. Like mm-hmm. we never seem it's this thing, not just with this Leafs team, but every Leafs team. It's their Stanley Cup be- beating us, basically, right? So mm-hmm. they get up for it. They'll be like, and that's the way it was. Like, it's been with the Canucks, with the Flames. Like, they come out, start on time, and they get ahead, like, 3 mm-hmm. nothing last and, night. And, like, last night, it was, yeah. like, a surprise yeah. to, to our team. And it's like, going to be the same. How can it still be a surprise? No, I, I don't understand that. Yeah, and next, that Saturday night versus the Senators, it's going to be the same. They're mm-hmm. going to come out flying. Mm-hmm. And and it just, <laughs> we need to be better at that, basically, like to be yeah. awake and going. Yeah. All right, so before we close out the game, uh, the game, <laughs> the show, uh, <laughs> once again, a reminder to vote for Ladies Talking Leafs as the best hockey podcast for the Sports Podcast Awards. We are thankful to be named a finalist, and now we need your help to get us to the top. So please go to our show notes uh, wherever you listen or watch a show to find the link. You'll also find the link on our website and across all our social media channels, and our handle, again, is at L. LTL 1917. Yeah, and just a quick reminder again, we will be at the All-Star game taking in all the festivities, so make sure you hit that follow button um, wherever you wherever you see us on social media, including YouTube, um, and our handle is at LTL 1917. And we'd also love to hear from you, so leave us a rating or review Five stars, of course, right? That's the easiest thing that you could do on Spotify. You could just hit five stars <laughs> if you want. Um, but let us know what you think of the show. We'd love to We'd love to hear from you. It's easy on Apple and Spotify. Or leave us a comment on YouTube. It's important for our show to get more exposure as a source for Leafs content. And we thank you for taking the time. And another way to help us out is by visiting our Ko-fi page at ko-fi.com. You can follow us there. And if you choose to, you can support us by buying us a coffee. Any donation goes towards helping us produce the show and making it even better for you. And of course, you can find the link to our Ko-fi page on our show notes or in any, in, or in any of our social media profile pages. Yeah, there's lots of, uh, lots of good content on our Ko-fi page, uh, with our, from our trip to Sweden, which mm-hmm. was an epic trip. So check it out. And yeah, and thank you to our healthcare workers and first responders for everything that they do. And we thank you, as always, for listening and watching Ladies Talking Leafs presented by Bet Online. Until next time, go Leafs, go! Leafs, go. go.